Hello and welcome. We are so glad that you have joined us today. We are St. Paul Lutheran Church, and we are so happy to be with you here in this worship space, in your homes and in ours, as we worship together. I'm Laura Seacrest, the worship leader here at St. Paul Lutheran Church, and I want to just say, welcome. I invite you today to join with us, to engage in the service, to participate fully in what we are doing as we lift God's name up, as we sing praises, as we communicate with prayer, and as we hear God's word. Put down all of the other distractions in your house at this time and just focus for this one hour with us on what we are called to do. What we were born to do is to praise God, to hear his word, to learn about him, and to be in constant communication with him. So we welcome you to do that with us. We welcome you to get fruit of the vine and bread at this time if you haven't already done so. As a little bit later in our service, we will be participating with you in communion. And so to get that and to bring that to your space. Uh, also, we invite you to bring some candles to your space. If you are somebody that has an Advent wreath, at your house, it would be a great opportunity to have that next to you with something to light those candles. If that's not something that you have at your house, if you just have a candle that you would bring to the space to get your space ready as we light those candles in just a little bit. And this is the fourth week of Advent that we are celebrating with you today as we talk about how God's love came down to us to meet us to be with us here on this earth, to meet us wherever we are, whether you are in a worship space, whether you are at your home, in your kitchen, wherever it might be that you are watching this. God is meeting you there. God is with you. So at this time, I invite you to take a deep breath in. And as you exhale out, let go of all of the worries that you have, all the things that are on your mind today. And again, breathe in and become fully present and filled with God's love for you in this place, in your place. I invite you to bring to mind those people that are not in your home right now that you wish maybe were sitting next to you, whether it be a neighbor, a family member, or a loved one, whether it be somebody who's still here on this earth or somebody that has passed on, to bring them into your mind as we worship a God who loves us, who knows us, and who sees us. We begin our worship today as we talk about our Advent wreath and we light our candles. We will be singing a song um, to, to start that ceremony. And we invite you to sing with us. There will be words on the screen. We invite you to speak those words with us. We invite you to stand with us again and fully participate in our worship today. So I invite you to please stand as you are able. And we will begin with not the lighting of the candle. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to begin with our worship song, and then we will get to lighting of a candle. So again, please stand where you are and join us with O Come, Let Us Adore Him.
to adore him. As we wait on his coming, as we light our candle, I invite you to sing with us love's pure light. we see God's love for us embodied in our Savior's birth. Christ is our light and the source of everlasting love. Advent calls us to love others with patience and kindness. Christ is our light and the source of everlasting love. Advent calls us to be slow to anger and quick to to forgive. Christ is our light and the source of everlasting love. Advent reminds us that Christ commanded us to love as he loved. Christ is our light and the source of everlasting love. As Lois lights our four candles tonight, we recognize the candle of hope, the candle of peace, the candle of joy, and the candle of love. This fourth candle that we light tonight reminds us that God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have life everlasting. Today, we celebrate God's gift of love, and we remember that we have been commanded to love others as God loves us. Gracious God, Gracious God, as we continue, as we continue our, our Advent, Advent journey, journey, we are reminded that love came down at Christmas. Love, love amazing, love divine. You love, you love the, the world, world enough to send your Son, and, and now it's up to us to love others as you loved us. Remind, remind us that Christ is our light and the true source of infinite, everlasting Pure, pure love. love. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take a seat or to relax.
My name is Pastor Rodney. It's good to be with you in this fourth week of Advent. And we walk in this energy of watching and waiting and joyfulness that comes with recognizing God's faithfulness. And so uh, as a way of saying hello, I want to just share a few announcements with you about this coming week. Christmas is next week. And uh, next Tuesday, we ha do have an opportunity for those of you who might find this time of the year to be a little bit uh, of an emotional struggle or a time of grief or sorrow. Maybe you're away from loved ones this year. Maybe you're letting go of somebody who has died this year. We want to invite you to worship with us in what we call Blue Christmas. It's next Tuesday at 4.30, and we will uh, welcome up to a dozen people here into the worship space. And so if you would like to join us for the ritual live, call the office, please, this week. And if you would like to join us online, we are going to live stream it on Facebook uh, at 4.30. So if you'd like to join us, please do. And then Christmas Eve, we have this wonderful opportunity to worship together uh, in a liturgy and in a service that is going to involve all sorts of people from the St. Paul community. We will have live launches of that service at 4, 5, 30, 7, and 10. And uh, that live launch will be on Facebook. But you'll find the service on our website and also on our Facebook page. Uh, we look forward to worshiping with you in this new and exciting way next week, and uh, we continue to celebrate the ways that Christ comes to us in this time of the great COVID pause. And so keeping that in mind, I do want to just remind you that you have uh, the invitation, the opportunity to offer part of what God has placed into your life, especially in this time of the year where there's so much gift giving we, we recognize with gratitude that God gives us so much. God is the true giver of all gifts. And so we invite you to return some of that as an act of worship to be shared through this community of St. Paul out into Animos and into the world uh, to benefit people's lives, to educate, to form, to support people. You can do that online. You can do that with your envelopes. You can do that by dropping off a donation in the brown box outside the door of the office building here on East Cedar Street. Uh, if you have any questions about that, feel free to call us in the office. Hopefully you received um, a powerful stewardship letter in the mail this week, just inviting you and encouraging you to be a part of our stewardship here at St. Paul. And so it is with recognition of all of the ways that you share your time and your treasure and your talent in so many faithful ways that we want to offer a prayer of gratitude. And so let us pray together. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours. Your faithfulness is everlasting. Receive our offerings and bless them for the health of this community. We pray through Jesus Christ, our word of strength. Amen. And let us open our hearts and minds to God's word. Good evening. Our first reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11 and 16. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. 
Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed, and have done ever since the time I appointed no longer be disturbed, and wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did from the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Here ends the reading. Let us all read together Psalm 89, verses 1 through 4 and 19 through 26. I will sing of the Lord's great favor forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Once you spoke in a vision to your faithful people, you said, I have bestowed strength on a warrior. I have raised up a young man from among the people. I have found David, my servant. With my sacred oil, I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not get the better of him. The wicked will not oppress him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him, and through my name his horn will be exalted. I will set his hand over the sea, his right hand over the rivers. He will call out to me, you are my father, my God, the rock, my savior. Thank you, Paula. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the first chapter. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, Holy Spirit, will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. 
And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. The gospel, the good news of the Lord. So this morning I was, uh, I was engaged in a weekly text study with a number of pastors that I've known for um, almost 20 years now, ecumenical group of uh, Presbyterians and Lutherans and Baptists and uh, Methodists, and we get together every week and we talk about Scripture, and we talk about what we might share in our sermons. And in our conversation, we remembered a book that some of us had read about 10 years ago. It was actually published in 2008. It's called In the Neighborhood by Peter Lovenheim. And this book is a man who lived in suburban Rochester, New York. He had lived there most of his life. And yet, on this one particular day, there was a brutal murder-suicide just down the street from his house. It was actually a wealthy family, two physicians. Everybody in the neighborhood was shocked. But Peter went out and started to talk to some of his neighbors. And what he found out is that hardly anybody on the street even knew them. This family that was now rocked, that had essentially disappeared overnight, almost nothing changed. And so Peter was inspired because he was troubled. And what he actually did is he started to go up and down his street and knock on doors, and he did something very unusual. He asked people if he could come and stay over at their house for a night. He was thinking about sleepovers when he was a kid and how much fun it was to stay over at somebody's house, but more importantly, what it was like when you got up the next morning and went down to the kitchen and everybody gathered for breakfast. And that's where you really got to know people's families. And surprisingly, out of the three blocks that he went to, over half the people agreed to let him stay at their house overnight. And what Peter did is he listened to their stories, and he got to know them, and he talked to them about how much they knew their neighbors. And what he found out is what probably a lot of us have known for a long time, they hardly knew anything about their neighbors. There was a tremendous amount of isolation even in the neighborhood. And so he came away from this, and it actually ended up being an op-ed that was published in the New York Times, But what he came away from it was asking the question is, do neighborhoods still matter to people? And is something lost when people live as strangers next door? When they're estranged from each other? When there is separation? He didn't want to just write another op-ed. He wanted this to be a poignant inquiry into the behavior that many of us have just kind of accepted in our culture today. We started talking about it because I think that his observation and his inquiry and his writing ties a little bit into this first reading that we heard tonight from 2 Samuel. You know, his his, uh, question about the significance of spending time in people's homes in order to get to know them. Why? Because when we are invited into somebody's home, there's a kind of a vulnerability, isn't there? That people let down their guards a little bit, or there's a kind of a hospitality that's usually extended. And oftentimes, in a very short period of time, it turns into a kind of intimacy. It's at the root of relationships. And so in this story from 2 Samuel, I don't know about you, but my imagination just sparks and takes off when I think about this dialogue between God and David that is triangulated through Nathan the prophet. 
Because what do we have here? The great King David, who had ascended to his throne, and he had built himself a palace of Lebanon cedar. Why? Because that's what all the great, wealthy, powerful people did. And he finishes his house, and we hear him saying to Nathan, hold on, I kind of feel guilty. I'm living in this house of cedar, and here's God, the Ark of the Covenant, in a tent, something that's temporary. And so he tells Nathan, I'm going to build God a house. And Nathan says, hey, David, whatever. God's on your side, man. Go for it. But that night, Nathan has a dream. And in the dream, God says, Nathan, you go back to David and you tell him, I don't want him to build me a house. And Nathan gets to David and he says, here's what God has to say, David. Look, God's been with his people since the time he brought them out of Egypt, moving from here to there, through the desert, through Moab, across the River Jordan, into the promised land, always with his people in the tent, in the tabernacle, in the dwelling that could be taken down and set up. Why? So he could be accessible and the people knew he was with them. He never asked any of the leaders to build him a house of cedar. It's not important to God. David, don't forget, God's the one who brought you up out of the field of sheep, out of your father Jesse's field. God is the one who took you by your right hand and led you to your ascendancy to the kingship. God doesn't want you to build him a house. Why? Because God knows that as soon as David places the Ark of the Covenant in a permanent building, especially one that's beautiful and rich and wealthy, there will be an automatic separation from the people. God will be less accessible. The people who live up in the Galilee will have to travel four or five days taking off work just to come down and spend time in the presence of their God. If David gets his way, they'll have to pay a tax to keep it kept up. It will become a separation that God did not ask for. God does not desire he, he wants to stay accessible. He wants to stay with the people where there is a vulnerability and an intimacy that they have known all along. But Nathan, using God's words, turns the story over and he says, David, God doesn't want you to build him a house. In fact, God is going to build you a house. But not your palace. Not, not these possessions that you think are important. Not this ascendancy and this, this virtue that you seem to have. This, this tremendous amount of, of dignity that you seem to carry for yourself. No, that's not what God is going to provide for you. He's going to provide for you a lineage. A household of people who will be called to lead his people Israel, forever. Your household will be forever because of your faithfulness. That's what God will do for you, David. Take that. And I sort of imagine God and Nathan saying it with a little smirk on their face. Ha, David, who's really in charge here? And, you know, David goes and tries to build God the palace, right? Tries to build the temple. Doesn't finish it. It becomes a source of tremendous conflict for the Jewish people. We know they, they form all sorts of rituals around getting to the temple, getting to God, getting to that place where God is. Because you can imagine and you know, as soon as somebody says God is scarce, God is there, it implies that God's not here. And the people struggled with that question over and over and over again. I wonder if that isn't what we've done for ourselves, even in our own Christian tradition, where we quickly 
point to our churches and we say, there's God's house. That's where God is. We point to our leaders, our worship leaders, and our pastors, and we say, oh, there's people who have accessibility to God. I wonder if I do, if I'm not around them, if I'm not engaged in some kind of part. How, how are we related in that? If God is there, is God not here or there or at my house? I wonder if we have made God less accessible. You know, this, this time of COVID has really riveted this question in my heart and mind. Where is God dwelling? We're not gathering in our churches right now, are we? And yet our God, we say, is with us. You are gathering in your homes. You're in your households. Is God with you? You know, this is where I think the gospel takes this to a, a place of great hope and great gift. Because, see, from the time of David forward, the Jewish people struggled to know that God's promise to David to establish a, a, a permanent, an, an eternal kingdom didn't always look that way to them as their kings were corrupt and as they were taken into exile and as they struggled, as they suffered under Roman oppression, when it came to the time of Jesus, the people seriously wondered, where is our God? Is our God with us? Is God's promise to David true anymore? A descendant of David isn't even on the throne. And then we have this beautiful story. God visits his people. Through Mary, this young woman, not yet married, a virgin. She's not yet had her firstborn. And Gabriel, whose name means God is my strength, appears to Mary. God wants to dwell with his people again, Mary. Will you be the tabernacle? Will you be the tent? Will you be this temporary place that God resides so that he can be born into the world more fully again? And even in spite of all of the, the curiosity and the questioning and the wonder and the doubt, Mary says, yes. Let it be done to me. I don't know it all. I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not sure what the future means. I don't know if this will bring harm to me. I don't know how this is going to go. But it's the hope that we've been looking for. Jesus, God saving his people. How? By being with us again. The chance to, to birth a son who will be the king that will take David's throne again, who will continue this messianic kingdom. I want to be part of that. Yes, let it be done to me. And Mary's yes allows God to dwell among his people again, looking like one of us, reminding us that God is in our midst through healing and preaching and reaching out to the vulnerable and the marginal. And Jesus brings the love of God to the people again and reminds them God is with us now. God is not scarce. God is abundant. God is where you are. That's the gift of Mary's yes. I think we are called as Christians to be like Mary in practicing saying yes to God. Use me to dwell among your people. Move with me, God. Make yourself known to people through me. Let it be known in my household, God, that you are with us. We have lots of symbols 
in our tradition that remind us that God is with us. We have the cross. We have an Advent wreath. We have candles. We have lights and a manger scene, perhaps, to remind ourselves that God dwells with us. Emmanuel, God with us. We also have the breaking of bread. And you know, we've been practicing here at St. Paul in this COVID time an opportunity to extend this altar out into all of your homes. The table that we gather around where bread is broken. We were talking yesterday with another group of pastors and one of them was sharing a memory that he had. His grandparents, every morning, would break a piece of bread off and feed it to the other, saying, the body of Christ be with you. Every morning they did that in their home. Was that sacrilege? Was that being outside of the tradition? Was that doing something that they weren't called to do? No, I am convinced that is exactly what Jesus invited us to do in taking this very ordinary act of breaking bread and reminding each other, reminding ourselves of the tremendous love of our God that we are fed in relationship with accessibility and vulnerability and intimacy. To feed another person is one of the most intimate things that we can do. We are invited as Christians to do that. Parents, grandparents, we are invited in our households to feed each other. We are invited as people who our children watch, people that our children look up to. Our people, our, our children watch for integrity, to model what love means. We're invited to practice yes. Yes to God doesn't mean we're perfect. It means that we're willing. We're willing to be faithful. We're willing to be filled with grace. We're willing to be God's tent, God's tabernacle, God's dwelling for a world that needs to know, desperately needs to know that God is with us. I invite you to join with us as we sing, Mary, Did You Know?
you to confess with us the words of the Apostles' Creed as we say together. I believe, I believe in God, the Father, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. earth. I, believe I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ His only Son, our Lord. Lord. He was conceived, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born, born of the Virgin Mary. He, he suffered, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the, On the third day, day he, rose he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. God of power and might, fulfill your promise and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. I invite you to take a moment to call to mind and heart those people and situations that you would like to join to the prayers of the church at this time. Gracious God, all generations call you blessed. In this holy season, we pray for our neighbors of other denominations and faiths. We ask you to inspire the faith of their people and draw us all together. Cultivate understanding among us and strengthen us in love and service to our common community. Creator God, you scatter the proud Everything we have belongs first to you. Bless and protect the seas, mountains, plains, forests, skies, and soils that surround us. Please give us humility as we tend them. Righteous God, you humble the powerful and lift up the lowly. We pray for the leaders of all nations that they amplify the voices of people in need. Guide all people entrusted with leadership to create societies in which everyone can flourish. Compassionate God, you fill the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty. Nourish those who lack access to adequate food and nutrition. Be with those who live in food deserts. Bless the work of advocates, community organizers, food pantries, all food providers. Encourage others to provide for their neighbors in need. Healing God, you pour out mercy to all who cry out to you. We ask you to surround everyone in need of healing in mind, body, or spirit with your tender presence. We lift up to you tonight, especially those who have asked us to pray for them. Lyle Cook, Jerry Hankmeyer, Nick Hartelt, Marlon, Willie, Karen Kleppe, all those who are facing the challenges from Corona. And we pray for the families of Margaret James and Dorothy Willie who are grieving the loss of loved ones. 
Eternal God, you are faithful to the promises you made to our forebears. We give thanks for the ministry of all who have gone before us, leading us in faith to you. We lift up to you Katerina von Bora and other ancestors who organized, planned, dreamed, encouraged, and reached out as they served you. We give thanks for the bold leadership of female leaders in our own time. Inspire others with their steadfast witness. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to take a moment to exchange a gesture, a sign of peace with those around you. Peace. I invite you to bring your bread and your fruit of the vine close to you at this time. If you haven't lit your altar candle, your table candle, go ahead and do that now. We uh, remember that it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he was at a meal with his friends. And we remember that by joining our voices in singing the song, Remember Now My Children. When asked how to pray, Jesus responded to his disciples by giving them what we call the Lord's Prayer. Let us join our voices in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My friends, Christ is the one who has prepared this meal for us and joins us in this celebration of life and love. Eat the bread of life, drink the cup of salvation, and know God's gift to you. My friends, let us pray together. Gracious and abundant God, you have done great things for us, and we rejoice in this bread and cup you give us life forever. In your boundless mercy, strengthen us and open our hearts to our neighbor's needs. 
for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long expected Savior, fill you with love. And the unexpected Spirit, guide your journey now and forever. Amen. I invite you to please stand where you are as we sing about God's joy with joy to the world, unspeakable joy. Joy to the world, the Lord is God. Let earth receive her King. Let arrives in your place, that that joy, unspeakable joy, <coughs> excuse me, would rise in your soul, and that you would feel his love to overbounding. I'm going to invite you again to please tune in to our Christmas service and make it a part of your evening on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And we say together, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we go into the world to creatively connect, intentionally grow, and joyfully serve. Thanks be to God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, blessed week. <laughs>